Okay. Welcome, everybody, to Nauto's Nerd Hour. Happy Friday. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Today, we've got, of course, Mr. Oh, oh, Mr. Nauto, the expert, the sharpening wizard himself. <laughs> and he's going to be talking about uh, sharpening decayed knives, what's different, what you need to know. Uh, they can be a little bit tricky to sharpen. Uh, we've, of course, got the sharpening cam back today. So, as always, uh, pop your questions into the comments. If you want to uh, see more of this kind of stuff, we'd love to subscribe and hope you guys enjoy the show today. Why don't you take it away now, though? Yeah, the, uh, some announcements to make. The, we just got a whole bunch of storm came back in stock. Uh, for those of you who left the um, um, email me when the, the item's available, uh, they just came back and you should have received some email notifications. Uh, beside, uh, with that, we got the, some... Um, um, Yamada um, hammered walks as well as some cornrows as well came back. Um, if the weather is getting nicer in this, uh, well, at least Calgary, I think it's going to be like 15 degrees uh, over the weekend. It's a perfect barbecue weather. Um, you know, still a lot of restaurants are just doing the takeouts and stuff like that. I think why not? You know, why don't we just go out and do the, our own barbecue kind of stuff, right? Weather. Um, yeah, so we got a whole bunch of stones back, including the uh, whole selection of the uh, knife or stones. So it's we got super excited. Okay? So today... Yeah, I'm excited. We've been, we've been out of some of those for a long time, haven't we? Yeah, the um, sometimes those uh, people at the port want to do a uh, little bit of inspecting. So we... Uh, we they they got inspected by the Canada Border Service Agency and uh, kind of got delayed co for quite a while. So now it's back. So we're yeah. We're, they they must think we're trying to smuggle something in with those sharpening stones and barbecues, huh? I'm I'm excited. It's so nice in Calgary. Like the sun's been coming into my office all week. I'm uh, I'm gonna do some grilling this week, and I think yeah. bust out the Conroe. Yeah. No, well, today's all right. Is the uh, how to sharpen a. Uh, this Takeda knife properly. Uh, the reason why I chose Takeda today is that the uh, I came across um, another um, Takeda came in for sharpening and uh, the handle repair as well. But uh, that particular knife has been sharpened by a, a customer, but the, it was sharpened quite uh, differently. So um, different so that it doesn't um, cut as nice as it should. And the the sharpening that put the wrong way will make the uh, knife um, doesn't like last as long as it should. So uh, today I want to show you uh, the way um, the Takeda-san usually sharpens so that it uh, prolongs or that the knife itself is gonna last as long as it should. Okay, so. So I have some papers that people can see here. <laughs> Japanese knives, most Japanese knives are made with like this way. I, hopefully it's gonna show good. So Japanese knives, like whether it's a, uh, well, I'm just gonna do this. Then, so Japanese knives looks like a you know cross section of pencil here, but the it's got the hard steel core, and lots of knives do have this uh, the shinogi line so called. It's the uh, bevel line, and it tapers from here, and there is the micro bevel. A small some people call it koba, right? So when we sharpen these knives. Uh, when the knife is thin enough, we just sharpen the koba, and when it gets thick or the uh, something that we want to keep uh, thinning, we just sharpen this part, which I have covered, uh, which I've covered a few times on that day of my show here. So this is called thinning, or we call it hot rotting a knife. You know, it's it's quite a bit of a steel removal happening, right? So this much then we'll put the micro bevel after that this is the regular sharpening process that we do so the thinner the bevel is when you cut into the carrots potatoes yams it glides in so much smoother 
very typical、uh, construction of the Japanese knife. Takeda-san's knives are different. As comparison to this knife, Takeda-san's knife. I'm gonna actually draw from the spine. And pen is not good. Yeah, his his knives are quite a bit different for a couple of reasons, right? Because they're they're much thinner than、uh, a standard Japanese knife is. He pounds them out more, but they've also got a, a much different bevel, which I'm sure a lot of the folks viewing are aware. But it really affects the way you sharpen it quite a bit, doesn't it? it does cool. This is what the、uh, Takeda-san knives, the cross section, looks like. There is no micro bevel at the end, so what you want to sharpen is really just right here on the bevel, which is actually relatively easy if you want to do a just regular upkeep of the a、uh, Takeda knives. So there is a little bit like that. That's the core steel. Little bit of um um trivial knowledge from Takeda-san. If you watched it the our、uh, live show last week when I talked about Takeda-san, I talked you know said Takeda-san hammers so many times, like probably as twice as the other knife makers do. And that results in making that the blade so much thinner than others. But, but the、uh, because of that, he while he's forging it, while he's pounding the steel, he、um, he kind of the、uh, has a little bit of problem. What happens is that the again J、um, Japanese knives. Three layer steel, right? Hard steel in the core, softer steel on the outside. Naturally,、uh, thinking it's like, say you know, if you try to a,、uh, it's like a hamburger, right? Soft buns. It's like you know, simple. Right. Yeah. You you you've got the buns on the outside holding everything together, but the patty is really the the part you want to pay attention to. Think, think about it, Nathan. If you pound that, if he pounds or it squishes the McDonald's hamburger too hard, what happens? Well, I I think we've all been at a pub eating a burger,、uh, mm -hmm. and there's too much mayo inside, and it gets squished, and everything kind of just slides apart. So is that what happens with the steel? Steel, the core steel doesn't slide out, but what happens is that softer part when they start from the steel. Like the three layer, like this, right? Can you, can you see? It's kind of three layer, like this. As he pounds it, this softer part will get actually a.、Um, it can、um, it can make, become like thinner faster than the core steel because it's softer, right? Right, because it flexes and, and bends more under the pressure than the the core steel is going to. It's going to、so、absorb what, more of the shock too because it's on the outside. What could ended up doing on the cross section of his knife is that the, you see these extra,、um, like softer steels, starting to actually flake off like a、uh, very thin line of the steel coming off. And when this comes like rolls out like this and、um, gets in by the hammer. They leave deeper marks, right? Because they this can this can curl, like core steel, and this can curl, and this curl can can、uh, actually you know bang into the steel, leaves the deeper marks. So he sometimes stops and pinch this with the、uh, the little little thing, and it pulls and take this off. It's a lot of extra work. Really? So, so he's yeah. So he's manipulating the outside of the like the cladding steel while he's forging the knife. It's a lot of extra work and attention to detail. This is result of the、uh, making the it like the steel super thin, but he doesn't like this, so he 
pinches and takes it off. So it's it's a lot of work. Anyways, that's a. And and how does he do that? Does he have a pair of tongs where he's kind of like pulling off bits of hot steel while he's forging, or? Yeah, it's like that. The, it's, yeah, it's like you know one of those tongs that the uh, people use to uh, hold the knife. That's how they use, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like he's pulling taffy while forging a knife, so he's doing two jobs at once. Yeah. He's, a, he's really good at making knives, isn't he? He he, is, he has a different uh, thinking process, but it's it, it's great. Alrighty, so let's just get on the uh, the actual sharpening part here, okay? So I just got the uh, new. 220 stone out because it gets super thin and if I press it too much I, it may be it break it broken so uh, I just put the uh, new this knife for 220 out here so you have to be a little bit careful when you're sharpening together what you do is not to give a angle like this this is about 15 degree angle that I usually sharpen that the uh, Japanese knives with but his knives, I just press it where the bevel is. I'm just going to move the camera a little bit up from the upwards here, okay? So. Yeah, and if anybody is, is wondering about the secondary camera angle, we're now with hands working, you can't see what he's doing, let us know, and we can, we can always adjust it. So you're doing sort of a teeter-totter thing, like you're rocking the knife on the bevel a little bit on the, on the stone there, hey? Yeah, when I press it down, this is, right, it moves. Um, it's probably worth mentioning how Takeda-san sharpens as well. Takeda-san sharpens by actually, he does it a little bit weird. Uh, it's, it's different, I guess. The, uh, what she does... Yeah. Yeah. It's weird watching him work. It's almost more like he's sharpening, like how people sharpen an axe than how most people sharpen a knife. He marks where the bevel is like this. I should have done the uh, and also put the dark side. But I'm just going to do this. He marks the bevel with the, uh, the you know, the markers and stuff like that. Then he has the handheld sharpening stone and works on it. Um, it's the same thing. You could just do the same thing on this one here. Only thing, again, you have to be careful is that the, you don't raise that angle. You just follow that the bevel. Okay? But a little bit of trouble or a little bit of um, downside to this, this trick here. He says to uh, sharpen it until you don't see, you, you take off the, all the markers. But this marker can be taken off super fast. Yeah, in my experience, marker grinds a lot faster than uh, carbon steel does. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fine, but it's not necessarily that the best way to sharpen. Really the best way is, again, Pretty easy that the holding us um, angle where the bevel is back and forth. See how shallow the night angle is. And I do it on. Yeah, you could be you could be mistaken for thinking that that knife is almost on the stone. Yeah. Like almost like the face of the knife is touching the stone. Yeah. Great thing about his knives also is that the his knives are much much. Um, it's thin, but it's not as fragile. Like I've, I've seen very little chips out of his knives. I think it's part of the uh, heat treatment process that he does. It's the uh, probably the annealing process. So I remember when when Fujiwara-san was visiting Calgary uh, about five years ago. He said we we asked him why he preferred uh, working with super blue carbon steel, and he thought it was more elastic on sort of a, a molecular level. Do you think that has anything to do with why Takeda uses super blue or why you find Takeda to be more rugged than you would expect? I would probably say it's the, uh, the molecule structure after annealing. He, um, he aims for the certain structural 
uh, crystallization types, uh, which is the uh, more circular or the round shape. So when so annealing, for those who don't really know about an, what the annealing is, um, I explain it like a so the process of which is that the after you bang the steel with the spring hammer to make it the shape like a knife, uh, what they will do is the uh, they heat up the steel again to the certain point, leave it for a little while, and gradually, uh, usually like leave it in the oven um, overnight, and gradually um, lower the temperature to the room temperature. But so it's like you're taking your knife to the spa, like it's kind of stressed out, and you're just you're just giving it a massage and letting it relax a little bit and calm down. Yeah, you know, what it does though, it's more like a um, yeah, it likes relaxes. I, I use the analogy of the ice or something, right? When you have the solid ice, you crash in, crash, and into the, the you can make it any shape out of it, right? And you put it in the mold. And you let it like temperature goes up and cools it down so that it kind of settles at the uh, right. So because all oh, the crust crystallization and stuff are all uh, banged up with the uh, with that uh, uh, forging process. Right. Yeah. You're just you're you're lining it all up essentially. Yeah. So they call no. it something like normalization, right? Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now, Takeda, you said he sharpens his knives a certain way. Does he do all his sharpening himself? Like, does he do all of the work on his own? He has two apprentices. Well, not apprentices anymore. His, uh, uh, he has Shosui, uh, his name is Shosui Takeda, right? And he has Tansho, and he has a uh, Yusui-san. Now, two, uh, two people working together. And most of the forging, um, he does finish all his knives uh, with the uh, uh, handheld stones, yes, he does. But the a um, lot of sh like m in between sharpening process, like from this point to just get the bevel out, or the uh, one uh, step before, they actually use one of those the uh, sharpening wheel. Um, it's done by Yusui San. Cool. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, do you have time for a couple of viewer questions, Naoto? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, we'll start with Mr. Grant Hendrick. Uh, thanks for tuning in as always. He says, happy Friday. Uh, last week was great. And again, I can't wait to listen live. Uh, could you please comment later on different slash favorite powdered or stainless, semi-stainless steels? Cheers. Hmm. The um, favorite powder steel, um, from my perspective, there are a lot of steels like uh, for uh, knife making, uh, ZDP-189, half 40. I haven't uh, used it, but the, there is half 72, which can actually get to uh, hardness of uh, Rockwell hardness C for 70, which is just insane. That's hard. insane. That's yeah. so hard. Um, I still like SG-2 and R2. I think the reason why you see that knife a lot more than the other type of steel um, not because of the cost, but it's just really, it's well balanced uh, in between the edge retention, uh, edge it takes, uh, and ease of sharpening, right? The um, Because it's like, it gets anything over Rockwell 65 with the uh, high wear resistant, like half 40, makes it so hard to sharpen. Um, so it's like I, I I see it more like a uh, uh, user and also the uh, sharpener perspective. So it's I may have a little bit of different opinion from the uh, some people say no oh, ZDP is so so good, uh, but the when it comes to sharpening and you know eventually you have to either thin it or you have to remove quite a bit of steel off, right? If you don't even if you don't chip your knife, you still have to remove a lot of steel off and, over time. So um, yeah. Yeah, I uh, I have a Mugen half forty, uh, one of those old ones, and I'm not super looking forward to sharpening it. Uh, well, I've, I've sharpened it, but having to actually thin it out is something I'm not excited to do. Uh, Sean yeah. Buckle says uh, half forty keeps it edge for a long time, but it's such a pain to sharpen. That basically sums up exactly uh, yeah. the you know the 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 beauty and the the pain of half forty. 
it's it's great, but it really is not fun to sharpen. Um, yeah, we've got a few. No, go ahead, man. What do you what do you have to say? No, no, we gotta get some uh, half forty lines three D in like soon. Do we have some on the way for the uh, garage sale at all? Probably, hopefully, hopefully. That's that's my hope. That, right on. Oh, that's, guess, that's exciting. I'm gonna comment because I just switched my hand. It's the same thing. I just did a one side until I raised the uh, very fine fine burrs. Um, what I found, especially on the Takeda-san's knife, is that the uh, although you raise a little bit of burrs, um, what happens is that it doesn't get sometimes you know, when you're thinning your knives, you see the edge becomes too thin and that the uh, start to flake off. It becomes like almost like a foil type of stage. This knife doesn't really get to that point. So I I can be a little bit more not a strong or I can but I can actually do a little bit more. Um more safely, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Right on. So uh, a couple more questions here. Um Jason Lynn says, uh, any hints for keeping that shallow angle on the backside when you're sharpening a decada knife? This, this here? Okay, so the um, key to keep the angle is really to um, hold that bevel down. I'm just going to, again, change the angle a little bit. Here, okay. Put, hold the bevel down. So that the it the it locks in place. Great thing about Takeda knives in both sides. Great thing about Takeda knives is that the it is sharpened on the bevel. Not the not you're not creating the angle by yourself, right? It's like sharpening a single bevel. But the uh, so make sure you don't grate your fingers by you know put it, putting pressure on the, the you don't grate your fingers on the stone. But yeah, it's it's not it's not a good feeling. Yeah. Lock in a place by pressing it down, because um, it, it when I like say try to move it, it doesn't it doesn't move as as easy. The uh, the guys in Vancouver who do sharpening night in Canada, they were on last night, but they've coined a term for when you grind your fingers on the stone. They call it stone finger, and I think that's appropriate because it sucks and it's it deserves to have its own name. Yeah. Now, Jason was talking specifically about uh, not doing ambidextrous sharpening, like just holding the knife with your right hand. When you're doing the backside, you've got the bevel away from you. The same thing, just keep your, your fingers on the edge there. Like right here. See, my fingers are always on that, the, uh, and it locks there. It doesn't move as much. Well, if I press it, it does, but... I, I, f I find, because I'm not nearly as experienced or skilled as now, so I find if I take my time doing it and I move more slowly across the stone on that second side, I'm a lot more consistent and the knife doesn't rock around on me as much. It's much mm. easier to keep the angle. Um, Andy Irion uh, has an interesting question. Can you put tape on the back side? I'm assuming he means to kind of lift the knife up off the stone a bit. Right. Um, you could, I guess. The, I've seen... Um some people done it, um, but tape is not strong enough though. It, it can get, get um, it can get ripped off pretty easy, ripped apart. So, yeah, you could use electrical tape, which uh, we sometimes use when we're sharpening straight razors, because some folks like to keep the spine up off the stone a little bit. But I find on stones that are are rougher than a thousand grit, even on a thousand grit, the tape gets ripped up pretty quickly, and the tape trick really only works well for finer stones like four thousand, eight thousand, that kind of thing. For well, those of you who watches or who's uh, who's been following us on the uh, you know the Thursday evening sharpening night in Canada, um, they use the uh, this uh, thimbles, you know, like a little rubber thing to have uh, protect your fingers with. You could definitely use that on taquitos as well, because what happens is that the uh, what you can do is that the uh, Put your little in finger uh, protector on your index finger. Set your angle 
because setting the angle on this one is pretty easy. Then your protected finger will go on the spine of the uh, knife here. Then use that index finger as your guide. I'm not going to do it today because I don't have the protector so that otherwise it's just going to grind my uh, finger off. So that's pretty good um, tool to use actually. Okay. Uh, Francis last night uh, had some in an interesting trick. Um, he was using some uh, neodymium magnets that were thin and he had just stuck that to the side of the knife and it actually seemed to work pretty well. It's, it's more like kind of training wheels, but it seemed to work for him. Yeah. All right, I'm going to sneak in one more before you go to the next step. Uh, Sean Coots in our Knifeware Ottawa store is wondering, would this method be good for more knives as well, since they have quite shallow bevels? Okay, so the um, little bit of difference between the Moritaka um, and the Takeda blade, although they look very similar. So, A little bit of father. Uh, I love this thing, the arm thing. Okay, so as I drew the Takeda before, Takeda. Takeda sounds like, like this, right? There's no, there's only one bevel and there's no micro level. Moritaka sounds knife is slightly thicker. But they forge into the uh, tiny bit of taper, then put the uh, bevel, then comma. The reason why their bevel is a lot lower than others is that they forge. So before they sh uh, sharpen them, they, their knife shapes are like. Uh, like this. Mm. It's more like a trapezoid. It kind of gradually tapers. It down gradually. That's why when they put the bevel, they don't have to do such high bevel. Mm. Right? So um, that's why. But they still do a micro bevel on them. So um, the bevel itself is much shallower. So if you actually do sharpen like a Takeda way, you start to see a lot more uh, flaking. And also the uh, the knife itself becomes so much more um, fragile. So I wouldn't actually finish the same way as Takeda do. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense. And if, if anybody missed last week's episode, that was last Friday, um, to, uh, go back and watch it. It's still on the YouTube channel. It'll be up uh, for forever. Um, but Naoto was talking about kind of his, his top 10 Japanese blacksmiths ranked in no particular order, but sharing a lot of really interesting info about how they make knives and what makes each of them kind of unique and really good at what they do. Um, and there was a lot of really cool stuff like that about the Moritaka tapering their knives and other other kind of uh, topics. Um, real quick while we're at it, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, it's just knifeware.com slash YouTube. But if you subscribe, you'll never miss an episode and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So the, um, I just done one side the other now there is a tiny bit of uh, burr on the, the side that the, the other side that i was working on the burr is tiny bit of a small metal uh, hanging on the other side that you can actually feel this right I mean, you shouldn't you may not be able to see it but i can feel it so that's the first step again the um the this uh, he, the Takeda-san, uses a, um, the handheld stone, and he uh, he draws it with he mark put the marker on and make it the uh, make it all the way. But the eye, those uh, markers or sharpies, they they disappear so much faster <laughs> than the it should. Yeah, you're not gonna get a burr just removing the marker because you'll just remove like the tiniest little bit of steel, right? Exactly. So I'm moving to uh, 1,000 grit now. So 
But yeah, I found Takeda Sun's knives are great because they make the, uh, although it's sharp and like pretty shallow angle, it doesn't, like, I'm sure Nathan, you have you had it before. When you're sharpening and you make it the edge too thin and uh, you start to see that the foil looks nice like, and start to bend. Yeah, the, the edge starts to like flake and you kind of panic because you don't know what the hell you've done and it's, well, I, I, the first time you do it, you don't know what you've done, but it's it's a very kind of terrifying thing. Um, yeah, because yeah, at that point you just kind of have to grind it back, right? And it's, yeah, it's not a good feeling to thin a knife out too much. Yeah, because the that's at the point that you have to be a little bit more careful. You thin your knife, but not too much, because the um, oftentimes not so much on Takeda, but the other knives, they they are sharpened super shallow angle, so that the knife becomes such a foil. And when the foil breaks off, uh, that's when that the profile of the knife will uh, will suffer or change quite easily, right? So yeah, uh, you can get sort of like some flat spots or what I think I think that's what people sometimes call overgrind, where you've got like kind of a dip in the profile, and then your your knife doesn't work the same. So it's not it's not great. Um, real quick, Darcy uh, didn't tune in right at the beginning. He says, "Sorry, I missed the start." Um, but what degree angle are we talking about in regards to sharpening and Takeda? So the Takeda sharpening is basically just you follow the bevel. Uh, so I'm just going to do it again on this one here. Move the camera up so that the people can see how I'm doing here. So Takeda knives, they're only sharpened by this bevel part. You don't raise the angle at all. So you just, well, you, the easiest way is to uh, lay it flat. Push where the bevel is, and <laughs> you make the uh, this space here. This is the angle that you want to sharpen. Yeah, so there is a bit of an angle, but it's not like it's not an angle like you're setting a bevel. It's just you're teeter tottering it right onto the bevel, and that's all you're sharpening. Yeah. Um, we good comment from Jordan Sue. This must be Jordan that just started at Knifeware Vancouver, uh, who is uh, the cameraman for last night's video. Uh, said I definitely foiled learning on the wheel, uh, and yeah, that is that's like uh, a scout badge that you get when you're learning to sharpen the, on a sharpening wheel. Is you there's certain mistakes that you're just going to make when you're learning, and that's why we usually sharpen our own knives before we sharpen customer knives because you'll definitely thin a knife out too much. You'll definitely scratch up the Kurochi on a on a nice knife. Like it takes some time to get the hang of it. Or just pull the when you're thinning, you touch the, the mirror polish part, and you spend another yeah, like, that's, two feet. That's, that's not great. I, I had a knife that I was thinning one time, and it was super badly chipped, and it was super super thick. So I was thinning it on the green wheel for a really long time, um, and it was really hot, and I was starting to kind of drift off a little bit and it slips and I got my fingers and that's that's another thing that can happen when you're sharpening on a wheel that you need to be careful of. Yep. I'm, I haven't uh, uploaded on my uh, face, uh, Instagram yet. I'm, this is my project that I'm working on. It's got the, it had a huge chip on it. It's a Kumo. It had a huge chip on it. So I um, took the chip off, thin it, and it's still got a little bit of a uh, scratch marks. I'm just gonna polish a little bit, then I will uh, acid etch it to bring that the the finish back. But I I got a few. Yeah, I think I think it was fighting Yusek tuned in last night uh, and said was asking about um, sending out Damascus knives because it it really changes the look of the knife and that that is depending on the knife that's the way to get the Damascus back is to acid etch it. Depends. You know, we were working on um, toward like we're we're actually looking at the um, getting some um, knives that the um, no the sorry the polishing uh, powders that actually try to bring that the same finish as the uh, sandblasted finish like a um, it's like a Kiri. So nice, we, yeah. It, it's nice to have that that in our toolkit for sure. We may so we may be getting a few to start and. Try to, uh, we're gonna try them and see how they're gonna work. Right on. Uh, you got time for a few questions now, Tom? Mm -hmm. Got time for a few, uh, for a few questions there now, Tom? Yes. 
Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Um, so oh, a little while back, uh, I'm not even sure if this is a question. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, I found a wide bevel, double bevel knife I like. Oh, this is fighting you sick again. Uh, bevels on each side are similar to single bevel knives. Would the technique you're demonstrating now be the best method to sharpen it if I get it? Uh, wide bevel double edge. Like bevels on each side are similar to the single bevel. Yes, it's like um, this method really works on the uh, Takeda knives. If you're thinning, um, just a thinning process on the double bevel knives, like for example, um, all, most the uh, most what you call it that um, what you call it the Sakai knives these days with that much taller bevel. This method will work to thin your uh, bevel out for sure. Uh, you still want to, especially those taller bevel ones, you may want to make sure you put the, uh, what we call it, the micro bevel after though, because otherwise the, the edge becomes way too thin. Right? Yeah, you end, you end up with something that's just way too fragile, right? Yeah. That makes sense. Um, in in relation to the uh, polishing powder question or that we were talking about, uh, mm -hmm. Jordan in Vancouver is asking, would that work for the sand and shimo finish as well? Would it give it a similar sort of finish? Shimo finish is actually relatively easy, Jordan. Um, what we do is the um, I've done a few uh, shimo finishes and uh, pretty done it successfully. Uh, we basically polish it up with the uh, some stones. Our Nightwear 1000, um, like smaller pieces of Nightwear 1000 stone works pretty well. So as the barkeeper's friend works really, really well to bring that the finish back as well. So um, um, Shimo is relatively easy. Uh, hard ones are one of those uh, stainless steel with the uh, sandblasted finish because it's the, it's, it doesn't uh, grind as easy. So yeah, the... Um, if you're in Vancouver, you know, bring it to the uh, Francis, and he should be able to uh, restore that back to pretty good. Because I, like, back in I was, like, I had a few uh, repair work on the Shimos, and I, I brought really nice finish back on these. Well, well, Jordan works in the Vancouver shop now, so Francis could teach him how to do it, and he could do it himself. I was like, oh. <laughs> this is my favorite comment today so far. Uh, Sean, who works in our Ottawa shop, I'm glad our staff are tuning in. This is exciting. Uh, says, all I want for Christmas is my thumb skin back. Megan from Ottawa after sharpening all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can relate. I don't work in the shops very often anymore, but when I do, um, like back in October, we had that charity sharpening drive and we got way too many knives to sharpen. So I just hopped in every morning to help. Well, you too, you were, we were both like sharpening like mad to help the shop out. And, uh, my fingers had no fingerprints left on them because I was not used to sharpening and forgot how to keep my fingers off the stone. Yeah, especially like when you're using the, the wheel all the time, and, you know, not realizing that, that the part, like the tiny bit of part is actually touching on the stone. <laughs> yeah, it's not, you, you can't tell right away that you're grinding your finger. It's not until... A couple hours later, you go to wash your hands under hot water, and you feel that sting, and then you realize you're going to feel that for for the next week or so. Sharpening on that be a really nice a, a white stone, and start to see that little red stream on it. It's just ah. Oh yeah, yeah. That <laughs> bloody stone is is not a good time. No. Uh, okay, we got got a couple more questions here that I was going to pop in here. Sorry, thanks folks for waiting. I know. Uh, we're, we're focusing on the technique today, so uh, not getting too many questions in, but we'll, we'll catch up. Um, Jordan, again in Vancouver, says, I've got a Shimo 210, Moritaka AS Sentoku, Marushin Nakiri, an unknown Hanasuki. Uh, any 150 petty recommendations for something unique that we might see soon? I like variety. 150, 150, 150. Um, 150 petty. Masashi? <laughs> Masashis are pretty sweet. Yeah, we're dropping that 150 these days, though, because we have this sweet Honosuke these days. Right? I'm excited to get those Masashi Honosuke. Well, we have we have some already. We have the Shiroshu and Kuroshu. I'm going to get a Koi you know, Oh, good. That's awesome. I might get that one. Koi uh, You know, 
you know what would be a great 150 Honda Suzuki? And I think we just got restocked on. We just got a huge shipment of Moritaka knives. So if you've been wanting a high quality, high end uh, carbon steel uh, knife, Moritaka is the way to go. They make super, super awesome knives. They've been making knives for over 700 years. Well, swords and knives. Um, but we got a huge shipment of them in last week. And so if you need a, a sweet knife, maybe get a Moritaka. If you want a 150 Petty, they make they make a 150 Petty, don't they? Yeah. 150 Petty, do you know what the like favorite 150 Petty is? the uh, I don't know if you have those right now, but uh, Takamura, um, Akagohan or Kurogohan, either or. I, I love those Petties because so thin. And tapers it so well. I think we have this a uh, Sakai O 150ml uh, Petty, Kiritsuke Petty. It's got a little Kiritsuke tape on it. I think we have that in the stock right now. That is, if I were to look for something super cool and unique, that may be the one that I will, I will be interested in. Yeah, I uh, I saw that knife when, when it came out to the garage sale. I'm shocked we have any left, um, but that thing feels like a scalpel. It is so light and thin, and that, yeah, I think you're right. That is that is maybe the best 150 petty ever. It's so cool. Yeah, that that is that is fantastic. Yeah, that is fantastic. Any other questions? Yeah, we got a couple here. I'm just scrolling back a little ways. These folks have been really patient, so thank you. Uh, James Wang, thanks for tuning in, buddy. Good to see you as always. Uh, what is your favorite steel to work with? Mine is white steel, white number one to be specific. Um, white number one's great. The, when I uh, when I sharpen uh, white number, I, I have one white number one steel at home, and it's it's great. Um, generally speaking, though, I everything considered, I like white number two. Like you know, price and co like cost and easy to sharpen and the edgy takes and stuff like that. But uh, white number one is definitely uh, something you know, something different. Um, we're gonna get the uh, some uh, white number one um, Fujiyama Honyaki uh, mirror polish uh, forced by the uh, uh, what's his name? Not Shiraki. It's Nakagawa san the the. He's basically uh, he's got all the skills from the Shiraki, and he is now he's uh, started his own name uh, Nakagawa Hamono. He's pretty well known name. We're gonna get the uh, uh, Honyaki from him pretty soon. Uh, we're gonna get 240 Fujiyama Hamon uh, Honyaki with the quince, super beautiful quince handle with the uh, quince um, uh, sheath. Oh, that sounds amazing. That that sounds right up James Alley because I know James has a pretty nice knife collection. When you say Fujiyama, you mean like basically no. a, like a Mount Fuji shaped hamon on the knife. Exactly. exactly. We had it before, no, right? No, Mount Fuji with Christmas moon and stuff like that. We had it before when I like when we started working. When I were. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to get it back. Um, a bit of a troubleshooting question here with Matteo. Uh, it says, hello, I have a problem with my shirogami number two day. Every time I cut food with high amounts of water or food like onions or garlic, it rusts immediately, even if I dry it right after use. What am I doing? Um, I I have a white number. Like the, I just got the um, old Sakai knives, and I thought it was going to happen like that, but the uh, it didn't. So one of the things is that the inmate, Take a little while to build the patina on the outside. Um, patina will build on the uh, outside of the knife slowly. They'll protect from the rabbit, uh, rabbit rust. You could force patina by a uh, uh, soaking in the coffee or um, soaking it like you know, put the uh, what you call it, the mustard and something like that. I, I don't like mustard idea because I would like to eat. So if you have like you know. Day, day old coffee that you forgot to drink uh, it's like so disgusting to even like microwave it uh i just gonna uh, soak the knife in and post the thing on it yeah if you, if you have any like instant coffee lying around that's really old that you want to get rid of yeah. good, good thing to do with that i'll pop a, a link in the comments um 
uh, Adam in our Edmonton store is a real, real nerd as well. And he uh, wrote a great article a few years ago about, about forcing a patina on, on your knife. Now you want to be careful. You want to do it slowly because it can uh, damage the, the edge a little bit. You can, you can uh, oxidize it a bit, but if you do it slowly and carefully, you can develop a nice patina. I, I would wonder um, with, with the gentleman that asked the question where that was Matteo, where do you live? Like, do you live in a super humid climate where you've got a lot of, uh, you've got a lot of moisture in the air or are you living somewhere dry? Because if you're living somewhere really humid. You might want to boil your knives a little bit before you put them away. And it could just be the, the water in the air resting them. Yeah. All right. From here, I did the progression from 2020 grit, 1000, 2000, then there is, so it's just right, it's just here. So what I'm gonna show you here, it's really quick, is that the, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm just gonna go back on 2000 grit. There's a bit of, tiny bit of burr left, so I'm just going to remove this really quick. So, the edges there, I sharpen them. So this is like pretty sufficient enough edge for a Takeda. The, uh, you know, I probably need a little bit more, um, which I'm gonna call it the uh, uh, stropping. <laughs> I just did the on the stone, right? But the, this is pretty good um, edge on them, right? Um, what the Takeda-san does is though the, uh, he uses the uh, middle, he calls, well, we call it tomonagura. Uh, it's broken in a half, so it's a pretty thin piece. But the, uh, he uses to finish this uh, bevel. Uh, one is to a, uh, you know, if you look here, it's got a really nice kind of, like, probably this camera is better now. It's got the, oh. <laughs> See, we we're working on the camera works and stuff pretty soon, but you can see a little bit of a contrast on the uh, you know shiny part, super shiny part, and a little uh, smoky part. Nice, decent kasumi finish on them right now. But the uh, I'm actually gonna use this Nagura, which we sell actually on our website. If you go to our website and search for Tomara Nagura, you should be able to find it. Um, but this, uh, he does just work on like this way. This is the only time that I do it like the Takeda-san. Because <laughs> he, he, this is how what he uses. And this is the only um, size of stone that we get from him. So this is just basically just go on the bevel. Just be careful. Um, because it's, um, yeah, it's right there and I sharpen it. I, yeah, I, so I sharpen a lot of axes and when I was first learning, I would sharpen like that sometimes and I cut myself really badly because even a relatively dull axe can cut you pretty bad and I can only imagine what a freshly sharpened Takeda can do. Yeah. What tips do you have for people wanting to do that same thing, uh, so that they don't cut the absolute shit out of their fingers? The, his Tomonagura. So this is the, the original piece. It goes like this. It's like this this thick. This is fine. It gets a nice height to it. So you, you know you tuck your fingers in, right? Um, this is dangerous because it's so skinny when you put your fingers around them. Um, when you buy the, the this stone, the Tomonagura, it comes in the uh, this so it should be fine <laughs> and i just linked it i just linked it in the comments if anybody has a uh uh you know takeda they want to sharpen they want to they want to get that stone to polish it up uh kyle bolden says um use a microplane cut glove the the cut resistant gloves that, that could work but uh i don't i don't think those are going to resist a freshly sharpened takeda i think you're still going to probably cut right through it if you're not careful <laughs> Kyle also says his favorite way to develop a patina is from slicing kielbasa or similar. 
I, I like that. I don't know how much acidity it has, so I don't know how fast it's going to patina your knife, but who cares? Cutting up delicious cured sausage is definitely a, a good way to build a patina. Yeah. So here, is the, uh, and this is the, in like, he, he does it, um, and no, two or three stones. Like, usually he does this, uh, like, this technique on the, uh, on the medium grit, then move on to the, this uh, stone to finish. This uh, Shobudani is that the mountain, Tomonagura. So it's kind of camera work is kind of weird, but. So, so you're basically just following the bevel carefully, trying, yep. like, not adding a micro bevel. You're just keeping with a consistent bevel there. Exactly. So the key is that the, you follow this bevel. I'm not sure which angle I should be doing this, but um, you don't want to make this angle like this. Just follow the just follow the bevel angle. You may benefit by actually uh, this process. You may benefit by. Uh, uh, put in the uh, those uh, more uh, what you call the sharpies. You leave the so, so not at the beginning, just just at the end. Once you finished on your fi finishing stone, you put some yeah. sharpie on there, and then you finish with that tomo stone just to remove the sharpie. Yeah. Well, those of you who joined us like a little bit late, just a bit bit of announcement today, I guess. We're, we're, we're sharpening and we're showing you how to sharpen the uh, Takeda knives, which is quite a little bit different from the uh, lot of um, other knife makers. Also, we are um, uh, doing this a, uh, well, just an announcement. We just got a whole lot of a uh, not knife sharpening stone shipment back uh, today. So they are available on the website right now. So if you want to a um, purchase, a stones or people have been waiting on the, the stones just um, hop on we hopefully have enough for a little while bit little bit yeah there's a few there's a few we got restocked that have been out for a while like we got the 4,000 grit back did we not yeah, and yeah. probably the knife for 220 which are both very popular stones yeah and we got a few Conroe grills back, as well as some Moritaka Ishime knives. We've got a big, big shipment of Moritakas and a handful of Conroes. So if you're uh, if you're feeling the heat like we are in Alberta, uh, maybe maybe you need to pick up a grill and start doing some grilling in March. Why not, right? Yeah, it's, it's beautiful weather this, this weekend, right? Yeah, it's been like plus plus ten, plus more. I'm I'm loving it. I'm just going to have beers on my patio for the whole weekend, I think, <laughs> as long as the weather keeps up. So by finishing on those natural stones, that will give a little bit, like it still does have a shiny and little polish, but it's got a little bit more milder finish. I did finish with the, um, uh, I no, I, uh, I've tested the other day with the uh, microscope that we have in our uh, warehouse. That goes up to a uh, thousand times uh, micro, a microscope, and when you see them, you can see tiny bit of a serration left on the taquitas, like you know, even brand new ones, and that works as a uh, really nice teeth on the uh, those knives here. I can't remember why this came back. <laughs> this is perfectly fine. Now. It's got the little weird. Any, so, any... so what was wrong with this knife in the first place? You said it was a customer's knife and it had been sharpened kind of incorrectly for a while. So what, what can people avoid doing when they're sharpening their own takedas at home? Again, the, uh, when you try to sharpen takedas, um, try not to sharpen them at the same as other knives. Like same as other, other knives means, you know, put in the 15 degree angle, right? Because Takeda knives are sharpened at their bevel. It is much like shallow. Look at how like little space there, like right in between. It's gonna do it. 
a little bit closer here. Ah, that's close. <laughs> this is how much space that creates with his uh, sharpening bevel. Usually 15 degree angle is something like this, right? So, okay. I'm gonna ignore the Calgary call. So, so that's the how little the angle is. If you pre put the pre like the apply the uh, 15 degree angle like this one, you cre you be creating the bevel too big so that the um, And that's going to make the knife too delicate and obviously not cut the way a skate is supposed to cut, right? It's not making it delicate. It makes it be too thick pretty soon. It's pretty fast, too. Because as you can see, Takeda, there are only like a tiny bit of like exposed core. And to go like surpass this, um, the core steel is really easy by putting the 15 degree angle. Right? And 15 degrees is really shallow as well, but it removes that the much more steel than it needs to. So it's like quite a bit of different. Like this is Takeda angle, and this is the 15 degrees. Um, the, he can do this because, again, the uh, heat treatment that he does is slightly different. He, um, he annealing process that he does. Annealing will uh, normalize the steel, but not only normalize, but he makes the uh, old uh, crystal structure into more like a circular or round structure. Sometimes when they do that, they make it a little bit more agile and also a bit stronger. That's why he can do this type of the uh, sharpening. Um, not everyone can uh, put this like shallow angle and make it as strong as the kid does. That's really interesting. And what about the people? Because, you know, you see stuff online and people have opinions and sometimes one person's opinion becomes, you know, a, a truth online. Um, what would you say about some folks say Takeda knives are too thick and they kind of wedge through food? Do you, do you find that or is that more just like a, a way people think of them? It will. The, it's, it is true in a way. Because again, that the beveling angle, although it's very narrow, shallow here, uh, what I would do, give me one second, I'll bring another knife for to show, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anybody has, um, has questions they want to ask Naoto, pop them in the comments. We're covering all the kind of nerdy aspects of knives today. So uh, sharpening techniques, especially advanced sharpening techniques, uh, info about blacksmiths and steel types and all that kind of thing. Uh, next week, we're going to be covering Naoto's top five or top ten Japanese knife sharpeners. So make sure you don't miss that. So what do you think? What so, have we got? So here, I have this uh, broken uh, little chipped uh, Yuki here. Yeah. Yuki's bevel angle, this is the original bevel angle. Bevel angle on this one here, like this is flat on this uh, um, flat on this part, and if I press it down a uh, bevel, this it's much shallower than Takeda bevel. Right? Like if you look here, this is Takeda flat. This is Takeda bevel. Right? You see the space here, obvious space, where it's a kagi. Hmm. So, so Takeda's yeah. kind of on like the, the midpoint between a primary bevel and a secondary bevel. Like he's kind of neither. He's, he's kind of straddling that line a bit, huh? Exactly. So this, uh, pro from the secondary, like primary bevel to the, the uh, secondary bevel, this taper, uh, Masakage has a little bit more nicer, shallower taper to it. So, if you want to cut, say, a carrot into a, um, um, say, a little bit thicker than the uh, inch, Takeda probably will wedge them a little bit more. Like, to be quite honest, I don't want to, you know, just say, no, I don't know, it may, right? 
because again, as I said, bevel angle is slightly higher. What this does really good though, cutting the meat. Mm. Goes up that the finish that he does, put in the uh, those the natural stones that gives you this a particular natural stone is a little bit more slightly more toothy, gives you that little toothiness to cut it into the uh, um, meats and stuff makes it so much easier. This is not the best knife to cut the daikon radish with. You know, try to get that really nice thick piece uh, with this. Even a lot of knives are not really good for daikon radishes. Like cutting daikon radish is actually quite hard to cut into like inch and a half uh, medallion, which is great for Oden. Um, I use my super thin knife like Masashi. It's got a wide bevels and stuff like that. So I use those. So it's... It's not all, so there's like pros and cons. Like Takeda knives, I like it, how thin this is. Taper may not be as like super shallow, but the uh, still works fantastic. But it is, like, it, is, it can be true when you try to cut the thick carrots. It can be mm. Well, and that makes sense because a lot of like cutting meat is cutting through connective tissue and, uh, and, and you know, fat and that kind of thing. Um, things that can be really, really tricky and a bit of tooth can be really nice to bite into it, especially if it's not necessarily super cold, if you've been butchering and working with it for, for a little while. Um, we, we, this kind of actually plays to a concept that we've been considering uh, for, for a show on our YouTube channel, which is comparing, you know, six or eight or ten different knives for a certain purpose, like just for cutting cured sausage or just for um, julienne and carrots or whatever and comparing a whole bunch of knives side by side because they're all going to cut a bit differently depending on the stone they're finished on and the shape of the edge and all that kind of thing. Uh, got an interesting comment from Fighting Usyk. Uh, terminology, in the pocket slash sporting knife world, primary bevel usually means from spine to the sharpened edge uh, with that being secondary bevel. Yeah, because a lot of like hunting knives for example, not so much maybe the Scandinavian ones, but a lot of hunting knives will have more of that taper from the spine down to the edge, and then they'll have that secondary bevel. What, what do you think, Nato? There are a lot of different terminologies. I mean, Japanese don't use the uh, um, you know secondary bevel for like primary bevel, but the uh, same knife like these guys, they have that the prominent bevel starting from this part. Uh, in Japanese, this uh, line is called shinogi, and shinogi from this beveled line beveled part is called the kiha and they have the uh the uh micro bevel or in japanese call it the uh, koba so it, it's like equivalent equivalent terms right some like japanese knives like this one here they don't have that the um the so-called bevel right it doesn't have that the prime like this shinogi line here uh we don't actually for something like this we don't use the terminology as the uh, like primary bevel from this part here. We just use that the, the, um, the koba. Koba means a, a small edge, right? That's why we use the terminology the koba. It's not the second or first. It basically means the small edge at the end. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense because there's yeah depending on who makes the knife there's a lot of different ways to uh to sharpen and bevel it i mean as we've seen today with the takeda it's totally different from a lot of other japanese knives and the, the outdoor knives i use are usually uh, a lot different too they're more they're more like a japanese knife uh like the scandinavian grind knives they're kind of straight along the sides and then they come to this really kind of triangular point um and it's called a scandy grind, but it, it's totally different from how knives are made usually in America or Canada or you know a lot of a lot of other sporting knives. Right, right. There's a, uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, Tifal Goron, uh, which one would you choose, the Takeda AS Hanasuki or Moritaka AS Hanasuki? The uh, the only problem with the Takeda Hanasuki is that it's large for me. <laughs> the size. He only makes it the uh, almost a Garasuki size. It's like 180 millimeters. Although both should work really, really well. Uh, both have very thick uh, spine to it. Takeda-san knows how to forge those thick blades as well. His his like axes are fantastic, right? It has the uh, so he has really nice uh, backing, super thick spine. 
then they got the really nice bevel to it. So both should work really, really well. I like Moritakas because it's a little bit smaller so that it fits in my hand a little bit. But yeah. those are really hard choices. I, I think I think at the end of the day, like with any knife, it depends on what you're going to be doing the most. If you're yeah. going to be cutting smaller birds like uh, chickens and ducks uh, or rabbits even, which uh, Hanasukis are great for, you're going to want a smaller knife. So the Moritaka is going to be a better choice. But if you're a hunter, for example, and you're shooting uh, geese and wild turkeys and that kind of thing, like big birds, um, you're going to want a bigger Hanasuki because a uh, Moritaka 150 Hanasuki is going to get lost in like a wild goose or a turkey. And you're gonna want a bit, a bit of a longer knife. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, question from Damon. Oh, it's a question for me. Thanks. Um, do all the straight razors come shave ready from the sale? Uh, so, for those of you that don't know, our sister store, uh, Kent of Inglewood, has a sale on during March. So, all of our razors are 15% off. That's safety razors, straight razors, and shavettes, which are disposable blade straight razors, um, and that includes. Japanese straight razors, known as Kamisori. Um, and they're really awesome. They're hand forged, much like the Japanese knives that we sell at Knifeware. Uh, so if you love Japanese knives, but you also want to have an amazing shave, Kamisori is a really cool way to go. Uh, the Iwasaki that Damon ordered is made by, uh, it's like a really old razor making family. Uh, Iwasaki-san is, how old is he? He's got to be close to 90 now, right? Uh, he, yeah, he, he, him and his father started forging after the Second World War, right? Yeah, his his father was a uh, kind of legend in that. Yeah, and, and 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 ha has written some really interesting material on on steel and on yeah. stropping razors and that kind of thing. Um, now his his I guess apprentice Mizuji son, who <laughs> not really an apprentice, he's like fifty five, sixty, right? Like he's he's well, a master. He's, for sure. He is older. He is like. 60s 70, 70s easy wow yeah so he he's making the razors now but he um yeah so damon ordered one of these razors and is wondering if they're shave ready for those of you that don't know straight razors need a really really fine edge even more so than a japanese kitchen knife because it's going in your face and not every razor manufacturer makes their razor shave ready they make it sharp but often you put it on your face and, and it's not so great to shave with so Good retailers will hone their razors before they send them out if necessary. Uh, Iwasaki-san's razors tend to show up perfect. Uh, we check them anyways because we want to make sure you get a razor that's in excellent condition. But um, that razor will definitely show up shave ready. If it didn't arrive to our store shave ready, we will have tuned it up and stropped it and done the necessary steps to make sure that it's perfect when you get it. So uh, day one when you receive your Iwasaki, uh, just pull it out of the box either up your face and, and get to shaving. You probably won't even need to straw it before your first shave. Pakistan's razor is like more than perfect. Like all, always more than perfect. They're so good. They're yeah, so good. One, one of those razors you can just cut the hair with, right? Um, yeah. 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 I, I've had one of his razors for like five or six years and it's it's just so incredible to shave with. Yeah, and a metallurgy. Like his father, like Iwasaki-san's father, Kosuke Iwasaki-san is the, one of the the people who uh, started to get those the uh, metallurgical ideas, metallurgical specific, um, facts, and those data into the uh, knife, like old uh, knife forging, right? And also, he is like Yosakusan, the father is like really such a character. He, um, his, it's been a family, the, the knife, whole selling a knife is his family business for a very long time. But the uh, after the Second World War, um, and even before that, the uh, there were a lot of like German uh, blades coming into the, the world, and you know that affected the, his family business. And what he ended up doing is that he went to the um, uh, Tokyo University. It's like Harvard, and in, in the states, uh, it's like the he went there twice. He went there first with the Japanese literature, so that he can read all the secrets of sword making in old Japanese. It's like you know English literature, right? <laughs> But mm. all the secrets are written in the old Japanese. So he went to study um, in order to read those um, like old Japanese literatures. Then he went back to the university and took the uh, metallurgy. So he has wow, like that's super cool from the University of Tokyo. Um, yeah. So 
he is a little bit of character nuts a little bit you know <laughs> but that's how uh, even even iwasaki son is a bit of a character he kind of looks like doc brown from back to the future like he's got <laughs> really crazy hair and you can tell he's just like super dedicated and focused to like making razors if anybody wants to know more about these check out uh spring hammer and spring hammer 2 they're two documentaries that we made they're on our youtube channel um and they're just they're about knife making in japan and, and the process and the history and and i think the one of the first interviews we have in the first one is with iwasaki san right yeah yeah he, he's, he was fantastic yeah yeah couple questions? uh yeah a couple more questions here if anybody has questions um Keep them yeah. going. I mean, it's it's Friday, so we'll be gone soon. But uh, keep your questions coming if you wanna if you wanna ask anything. Uh, Jordan uh, in Vancouver says the tip for the Hanasuki that I have, and that was the mystery one, which is made out of VG10, uh, is more on the Kiritsuke side, and the heel is larger. Does now to know if this is a regional thing? I don't know exactly where it came from. I may want to take a look at a picture. The Kiritsuke side is what. <laughs> That's more on yeah. the side. So, so the tip, I'm guessing he means the tip comes down more. Normally there's just a little bit of a slant, but the tip of the knife is really close to the spine on a, on a Hanasuki. I may have to take a look at it because it may be a regional difference. Sometimes the uh, Hanasuki wasn't really a thing. And like Moritaka-san, we asked them, hey, Hanasuki <laughs> is a shape that looks like this. Um, they're like, oh, okay. Uh, this is the full chicken morning and you know uh, has to be thick and you know that that's how sometimes it comes about so uh may have to take a look at the picture so if you want to you know send us a picture that that'd be cool right if anybody has questions for Nauto or just wants to see more uh knife repairs and sharpening and, and learn a ton uh follow him on instagram it's at Nauto kw and that's n-a-o-t-o-k-w and he posts a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of, a lot of repairs, a lot of uh, sharpening knowledge, some really delicious looking Japanese food that always makes me hungry <laughs> when you post it. I, I have to post some of the food pictures uh, now because I've got probably five nice uh, pictures, consecutive nice pictures. So, you know, that's uh, the idea. Yeah. yeah. W what are you going to cook this weekend? You should post that. Right. You know, I, I've got quite a bit of things like good – food pictures like over the like i haven't done any i haven't posted anything for valentine's and you know some nice valentine's dinner and stuff like that so it's 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 i have enough um uh, you've got some options yeah um fighting music says uh speaking of razors thoughts on using a hanging strap for knives um real quick for those of you that don't know usually we use uh, a strop a piece of leather attached to a hard board for stropping kitchen knives Whereas when you're stropping a straight razor, you want to have a hanging leather strop. I don't think mine's uh, accessible right at the moment, but you usually want to have a flexible piece of leather. You don't want to have it flexed, but you want to have a piece of razor that is flexible when you're stropping your straight razor. So they're a bit different. You could use them though, right? Because when I, when the uh, Shiba drops his uh, knives, he does it with the uh, um, old denim jeans, right? And he has them like a, he has them on top of the his sharpening station. He pulls and he does this. Right. So you know it's it should be just be careful not to cut into it because the leather piece of leather is not the, <laughs> the cheapest material. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Especially if you're using good quality leather. Like our leather straps are sixty nine dollars, and I think a, a solid chunk of that cost is just the leather because we use good quality bridal leather. Um, when you're getting into straight razors, like I have a, a Cordovan leather strop, and that's like a $400 razor strop because it's a really, really, really high end piece of leather. Um, and, and even the, the horse hide, which we like to use for straight razors, more mid grade, but it's, it's still, you know, $200 for a, for a strop because it's really high quality leather. So yeah, definitely be careful with it. D does Shiba have just like a whole pair of pants hanging on the sharpening station or is it just a strip? Pretty much the whole, whole well, like probably cut in half. Okay, yeah, that's that's kind of amazing. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Jordan said he just sent you a picture of uh, of the Honosuke on Instagram because he's interested to learn more about it. Check it out. I yeah. Wish. In, out. 
Well, um, I don't know if anybody else has more any more questions. We'll give you a couple more minutes to pop them in the comments. Um, okay. Next week for Japanese Knife 101, which, by the way, is at 4 p.m. on Friday, uh, Mountain Standard Time, Naoto is going to talk about his top Japanese knife sharpeners, his top five or top ten knife sharpeners, um, mm -hmm. and, and any any hints as to who you'll be talking about or what kind of stuff we'll be going over? So the, uh, there are so, like sharpeners and uh, knife um Basically, like some regions, they have the blacksmith and the sharpeners working uh, separately, right? And like Sakai is the good example. Sakai has the blacksmith forges knives, and there is a uh, sharpener that sharpens their blades, and they don't work uh, side by side each other. And like I, I, I'll mention a few um, Sakai sharpeners, as well as the uh, Santosa sharpener that I get to see. and. Even, you know, my favorite blacksmith who's really good at sharpening. <laughs> cool. You know, you know who maybe, right? You know, you know yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's yeah. really cool because some, some knives are made by two specialized individuals, a blacksmith and a sharpener, and some, some are made just by one person who's kind of a, a bit of a master of everything, right? Yeah. Right on. Um, Oh yeah, we got uh, got a couple more questions here. Uh, Fighting Usyk says, "Did you ever decide on a name for the TV show?" Uh, for those of you who don't know, we're starting a show in April. I think Kevin said April nineteenth is the the start date, um, but we're still finalizing that. We haven't finalized the name yet. I think we called it Sharp Knives Rock to start, and we've had some other good ideas. If anybody does have ideas, leave them in the comments um, because I'd be always curious to know what people want us to call it, but. Uh, yeah, we haven't nailed down a good name yet, but that's, uh, for those of you that, that haven't heard, that's going to cover, uh, a, a bit of everything, you know, some cooking, some interviews with local chefs, um, knife knowledge, obviously some sharpening some competitions and kind of weird challenges. We'll probably do some, some slightly bizarre stuff, maybe some live music. So a bit of everything. Yeah. And I, uh, I just get to talk to a, I haven't talked to a him. Ikeda-san directly yet, but I'm hoping to have the uh, uh, interview piece uh, made with Ikeda-san because the uh, he just uh, became a fifth generation Anryu Hamono uh, head of Anryu Hamono. So um, that's I really cool. Talk to him about that because the uh, generation change hasn't happened in that the uh, that particular Kaki Knife Village um, for a little while, and I mean like Kato-san took it over. So that was probably the one. But yeah, I mean, other than that, you know, so much generation change had happened in that Takefu Night Village. Um, Kurosaki san started his own workshop, but it's not, you know, past, like, it's not the direct. Um, yeah, that, that's a new, a new brand, sort of. Yeah. So um, I would like to talk to um, him about how he feels to be a uh, fifth generation. Of that, the very long-lasting, um, you know, family business and stuff like that. So, yeah, there could be a lot of cool questions. Uh, yeah. I, I think that that you could ask him, but also that viewers could could submit I as well. So, well, I may do it in the uh, Japanese because he's not really super um, outspoken person. Mm. So, I may do everything in Japanese and record them, um, put the uh, subtitle and the release them so that people can watch. Yeah. Them. Well, we we should do a do a live interview, like kind of a long one, and then we can we can edit it down a little bit and have a have a condensed version for for people. Yeah. Um, a few other bits of news that I have before we go today. I think we got we got one more question there that we'll that we'll get to. Um, but I think everybody's heard by now. But uh, our sharpening stones got restocked, so we just got knifeware sharpening stones back in stock, uh, including the much sought after four thousand grit stone, which has been out for a long time. Uh, we got some Conroe grills in, as well as Moritaka Ishime knives. Uh, just got a restock last week. So we got lots of great stuff at knifeware.com. Uh, our sister store, Kent of Inglewood, uh, that's, that's kentofinglewood.com. Uh, but we also have stores in Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, and Vancouver. Um, they're having a razor sale right now. So all straight razors and safety razors are 15% off. So if you need to take some hair off your face or your legs or any other part of your body, uh, it is the best way to do it. Uh, we've also got a new blog in knifeware.com, uh, which is all about Yuto knives and, and kind of why they're great, why every kitchen should have one, and a few suggestions 
I imagine everybody watching probably has a Qto already, uh, but if you're on the lookout for a new one, check out the new blog. And finally, we have a new video from Mike uh, about smashing garlic with your knives and, and how to mids it properly. Um, there, we see so many knives that come in because they're either bent from somebody smashing garlic the wrong way, and yes, there is a wrong way to do it, uh, or really aggressively chopping on their cutting board, and they've either chipped their knife or they've just really dulled it badly. And so Mike goes over some good tips on how to smash garlic with your Japanese knife safely, as well as how to mince it in a way that won't dull your knife quickly. Few questions, like I can see some few more questions that we can answer before we go. Yeah. So Kensho 320, if you found the Kensho Zan, Z Z A N Z A N um, series, it's pretty good. I've used the Zan um, 1000. The they were developing uh, 320 when I was there. Uh, Zan series is great. It is designed to cut your steel faster. Uh, it, they use a really good the aluminum oxide as a um, um, as a polishing compound or the um, abrasive, so it cuts really really fast. So um, yeah, it's it's good stone. I um, and they made it pretty thick as well. I think the Zan 320. So they they how they develop their product is the uh, they have this um, concept in mind that you know I they want to do this with the stone and they develop after. So um, yeah, that that stone is, should be pretty good. We haven't we haven't carried them. We have a lot of stones that right now, but uh, we haven't had them. But yeah. we should be pretty good. Um, good one from Lucky Phil. This is a question we get a lot, especially on our online chat on our website. I was looking at buying a Fujiwara knife, but I hear there the fit and finish can be inconsistent. What do you guys think? It's it's Fujiwara-san's a um, it's it's very unique. <laughs> They put it this way. He makes it really, really sharp. He uh, he forges and he he treats them really, really hard. And he, um, but yes, it could be a little bit of inconsistent. The handle uh, it may see a little bit of um, you know, um, not a super like, big gap, but the it, in, imperfection there. And he thinks it's cool because it's uh, handmade. So. Um, for those who like those a little bit more uh, imperfection by um, from that the handmade knife, we'll, we'll call it rustic. Yeah. So uh, it's um, it's not for everyone per, per se. Like you know, people who is looking for a perfect, like you know, super well fit fit and finished knife, they may not be right, but uh, it works really well. The Nathan, you have the Denka from him, right? Yeah, I have a 210 Danka that I've had for, like I said, he visited us five or six years ago, and, and that was when I bought it. I really liked his knives, but I, I became convinced when I got to actually meet him, and everybody was getting their knives engraved by him, so I, I really wanted to. But um, there, there's two things I, I think about Fujiwara knives, if you're looking to buy one. First of all, if you can, visit one of our stores, because we typically have more than one in stock, and we can show you a few, and you can pick your favorite one. So if you're a particular individual, which is totally understandable, um, you can come in and pick your favorite one. If you can't visit one of our shops, email us, hello at knifeware.com, or message us on our website. There's a little chat box, uh, and we'll show you photos of the ones we have in stock, and, and we can either pick the one that we think is best for you, or you can pick the one that you like the best yourself. The other thing is, your knife's going to change. Um, the way the knife is out of the box it's only going to stay that way for a very short amount of time compared to the lifespan of the knife. So my Fujiwara Denka, I've only had to sharpen it about twice, but it's totally changed because I've sharpened it. And I've been able to give it the fit and finish that I like. Um, nothing about the way his knives are made is going to affect the performance of the knife long term. There's no issues with the way the steel's tempered or anything like that. It's just like some polishing on the edge and grinding and that kind of thing. And those are all things that are going to change when you sharpen it yourself or you get us to sharpen it and um it's it, your knife's going to change and so i love my danka and i've fallen even more in love with it as i've sharpened it and it's developed and become more mine um, but if you want to pick a very specific one shoot us an email we'll be happy to help uh it looks great now to <laughs> uh kyle bolden said that just a comment says that'd be amazing if you did a video with he time he has some really big shoes to fill uh, which is totally true. I think he's very capable of filling them, but uh, yeah, that's that's a big a big step up. Yep. Yep. 
Um, Fighting Usyk, um, favorite Japanese whiskey? Oh, uh, I I don't have enough experience with it. I, I do drink a lot of whiskey, but I haven't had the side by side type yet. I had the mm. Ichiro Malt. Um, it was like one of those um, Ichiro Malt, pretty good, smooth and nice and uh, nice easy drink. I was rare piece, and my mom was into the whiskey, so uh, that was probably one of the nicer whiskey I had. But Ichiro Malt, I wasn't really aged that long, so it was okay. It's... Yeah, I, I I find Japanese whiskey to be really lovely. Um, I really like Hibiki. I don't I don't know. Like I, I drink a lot of whiskey, but I mostly drink just Canadian rye. Um, but Hibiki is really really tasty. I, I know it's not the fanciest, but pretty pretty delicious. Um, a uh, good one from Kyle here. Uh, I heard many years ago that some knife makers leave the fit and finish to the customer. Because it's a tool to be used. That's that's kind of my uh, my thought as well. <laughs> yeah, some some knife makers still do the a lot of Sakai knife makers. They don't really finish finish the edge. Uh, it's called honbazuke. Uh, it needs to be sharpened at the uh, at the customer's level. Also, the um, as much as lovely the massage stance knife is, he leaves that the profile a lot more flatter than the other knife makers. Because what he says is that the uh, uh, making a flat is harder than making a carved edge. So if the customer or that the uh, wants to use that as a more carved edge, they should be able to do it, make it easier. So they start from this uh, flat, then they can just modify it from there. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's totally a personal thing and. At the end of the day, if, if the way a knife is made doesn't totally suit your sensibilities, um, don't be afraid to take it to a stone and change it up a little bit. You know, you don't need to go nuts right off the hop because obviously it can be a bit intimidating, but um, don't your knife to a stone and, and adjust it a little bit. Worst case scenario, you have to send it to us and we'll uh, we'll fix it for you, which is what happened with this Takeda knife. It now to sharpen today and it looks good as new. Um, good question here, I think. This might be our last one for the day, but Damon, who ordered that Kamasori, said, uh, do you guys have any videos or resources available for learning to sharpen Kamasoris? Um, Damon, we've been looking, we've been working on making similar videos for our other brand, Ketabing Wood. We haven't got there yet, but in the meantime, we have a great blog that I wrote that I'm going to link you, and it's just about sharpening straight razors in general, um, and if you're doing some basic tuning up, of your straight razor, uh, your Kamasori, that should do for now. Um, but don't be afraid to email me, uh, Nathan at kentavinglewood.com, and I'd be happy to chat more about Kamasori honing with you. Um, I think I still have a PDF somewhere that uh, is a translated version of Iwasaki-san's book about razor honing. There's kind of some weird stuff in there about using like gasoline to remove oil from your strop and other strange things, but there's a lot of really, really cool, interesting info in there that I learned a lot from. So feel free to email me, Nathan, N-A-T-H-A-N, at kentabinglewood.com, uh, and I can I can totally help. Um, yeah, you got anything else for today, Nato? Oh, that's good. Thanks, for thanks everyone, for watching, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully see you see you next week. We're going to you know, yeah. talk about the uh, some sharpeners, and I'll do a little bit of research on the sharpeners that I don't really know as well, but I mainly like to talk about the people that I – I have seen, I have touched, I have got, you know, tried a knife with. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, thanks to everyone that tuned in today. Uh, if you give this video a like, we'd hugely appreciate it. We're still working on this whole YouTube thing, um, but we appreciate all your support. And it's you folks that are making this worthwhile for us and making us come back to this every week. Uh, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, subscribe. We're live three times a week. We've got all kinds of different content. We've got uh, recorded videos coming out every week too. Um, in the next month or so, Nauto and I are going to shoot some. Uh, oh, that way, Nauto and I are going to shoot some uh, knife sharpening videos and start to get more into some of the advanced technique that we haven't covered on our channel yet. So we will have a ton of cool stuff coming soon uh, for you folks to learn from and nerd over and and just generally enjoy. Uh, so thanks everyone. Hope you have a wonderful Friday. Bye.